The United States was never historically a free trade country. We embraced free trade after the Second World War in order to win the Cold War. The reality was that the world was in ruins and we needed to prop up the economies of foreign nations so that they wouldn't go communist and also bind them to dependence upon ourselves. That's why we embraced free trade. There was never any point at which we discovered miraculously that the policy of protectionism that we had embraced for 150 years was wrong and that free trade was suddenly right. Okay, the reality is that for many, many years, the United States practiced something that it called free trade. In point of fact, we weren't really engaging in free trade. For example, for most of the Cold War, the whole of China was off the market, that is, out of the international market, because it was a communist country. So was Russia and Eastern Europe. India was off the market because they were a socialist country. And large sections of the rest of the world, like Latin America, practiced a kind of inward-looking economics that wasn't that interested in exporting. So free trade for the longest time meant the United States, Western Europe, and uh, developed East Asian countries like Japan. Now, of course, the whole world is in the game. One might wonder why, if the U.S. embraced free trade as a Cold War policy, why we didn't give it up when we won the Cold War. Uh, the answer is that we had created, through this policy of free trade, a vast complex of special interests, which were now entrenched in power, and they were making so much money from it that they wanted it to continue, whether or not it still made any geopolitical sense. America's political leaders haven't responded to these problems for two reasons. The first reason is ideology, particularly a kind of pseudo-libertarian economic philosophy that doesn't seem to notice that the laissez-faire is all on the American side. The other reason, unfortunately, is a lot of these guys have just plain been bought. Possibly the worst effect of increasingly free trade or free one-sided trade in the United States is it enables corporate America, which is, after all, in a capitalist society, the people who are not entirely but largely calling the shots, it enables them to become indifferent to the economic fate of ordinary Americans. Now, if you just think for a second, it's fairly easy to understand why this happens. If corporate America pretty much has to make a profit by selling goods made by Americans to Americans, this means that corporate America has an intrinsic interest in the productivity of Americans and in their ability to consume. Now, productivity plus consumption is prosperity. I mean, that, that's pretty much all it is. So if you have an economy that's set up that way, then corporate America pretty much wants what the rest of us want. And for decades in this country, from roughly about 1940 to about 1975, there was an, uh, an arrangement in this country where things were set up that way. It wasn't perfect, but there was, broadly speaking, a structural alignment between what was in the interests of big corporations in this country and what was in the interest of the average American. The main way in which multinational corporations have profited from increasingly free trade in the United States in recent years, and of course, when I say free trade, I don't mean free in both directions. I mean increasingly free imports in the United States, is that it's become easier and easier for them to produce abroad, largely in countries that have lower wages, but also in countries that have aggressive industrial policies on the part of their governments to produce for export to the United States and subsidize exports to the United States. And as a result, they've made out like bandits. They've had increasing profits, remarkably enough, at a time when the rest of the economy has not been doing that well. We've been seeing record profits of Fortune 500 companies, which is a somewhat unusual result. Normally, for most of American history, 
corporate profits track the overall performance of the economy, but there's been an emerging disconnect there for some decades now. It's fairly obvious that the U.S. economy in recent years has suffered something of a cancerous bloat of an overgrown financial sector. Now, a lot of people have failed to notice that trade played a big role in this, or free trade, what it did is when we caused us to run a trade deficit around $500 billion a year, it fluctuates. But what you're looking at is the backwash of all our imports is that we had a flood of cheap foreign capital into the United States. This is capital that was artificially sent to the United States to buy our debt, to buy up our existing assets because foreign nations weren't getting goods in return for their exports to us. So they have to get something. So what they get is they get claims on Americans in the form of debt and they get claims to our existing assets, be it uh, shares of corporate stock, real estate, or whatever. Now, as a result of this very artificial flow of capital, which was artificially pushed, make no mistake, this is not a free market outcome, artificially pushed by governments like China, Japan, and some others, you have a flood of capital in the United States, which really shouldn't have been there. And when you have capital doing that, it starts looking for love in all the wrong places. So that was a major contributing cause to asset bubbles in the United States and to the general bloat of our financial sector at the expense of other sectors of our economy. Currency manipulation sounds like something technical and obscure. In point of fact, it isn't. It's very important because currency is money, so it determines what's profitable and what's not. So it determines what happens and what doesn't. Now, the deal is that when you have two countries with two currencies and they trade with each other, the relative price of those currencies, that is the number of dollars you get for one renminbi or vice versa, that's a Chinese currency, is set like any other price in a market economy. It's set by supply and demand. Now, the trick with currency manipulation is that the demand for dollars, for example, which determines the price of dollars, if there's a strong demand for dollars, the dollar will stay strong. That is, anything denominated in dollars will be expensive. Is that the demand for dollars is not only for dollars to buy American exports, the things the Chinese actually do buy from us, like the Boeing jetliners, like soybeans. There's also a demand for dollars to buy American financial instruments, which means debt and title to existing assets, which can be anything from skyscrapers in downtown Los Angeles to shares of Microsoft. As a result, if you have one country having a government that systematically forces its economy to purchase American debt and American assets rather than American goods, you can manipulate the relative price of the dollar and the renminbi, which makes American goods artificially expensive in China and makes Chinese goods artificially expensive in the US. Now, this is the reason why our trade with China doesn't automatically reach a balance. If it were not possible to buy debt and assets, then when the Chinese exported so much to us that they ran a huge trade surplus as they do, that would drive down the value of the dollar. American goods would become cheaper and cheaper over there. Their goods would become more and more expensive over here. Eventually the two cross over and we get balanced trade. That is no trade deficit. Our exports to them equal their exports to us and vice versa. The problem is when you have the systematic currency manipulation, and there's no secret how they do it. In China, when you earn dollars by exporting to the US, you're not allowed to spend them on whatever you want. You have to take them to a government controlled bank and swap them for Chinese currency. So you get your money and you get to be rich, but you don't get to throw them around any way you like in the international economy. And the Chinese banks, they take that money under government direction and they buy American financial instruments. A lot of it is simply T-bills. China has a voracious appetite for American T-bills, our own government securities. So as a result of this, 
The US dollar is artificially strong. Our trade with them stays out of balance. And we've been trying to get them to stop doing this. I believe the Congressional Research Service at one point documented, I think it was 457 different barriers to American exports worldwide. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if the Chinese have since added a couple. The fact is that when you have a state capitalist economy where the government may not own everything, but it can manipulate everything from the cost of international shipping to the price of real estate, the price of electricity, the cost of capital, the cost of labor, they can indulge in an almost infinite number of tricks to subsidize their own exports and to keep out foreign imports that they don't want. The big thing to understand about state capitalism is that in the larger sweep of human history, certainly going back to the dawn of global capitalism around the time of Columbus, state capitalism is the norm and the kind of freewheeling free market capitalism we cherish in the United States to a significant degree is actually a relatively aberrational form of capitalism. So what the Chinese are doing is actually very normal if you look at the larger economic history of Europe or indeed of the Far East uh, in the 20th century. Nothing they are doing should be particularly mystifying to anybody who's paid attention to economic history. Unfortunately, nobody cares about economic history anymore, which is a tragedy and it's one of the reasons why American economists are so blind to these issues. The way that China's lobbying in the United States and their manipulation of the American political system works is largely indirect because the government in Beijing is well aware that a communist dictatorship is not a particularly popular if it prowls the halls of Congress showing its own face. So most of their lobbying, certainly on economic issues, has been done by way of corporate America because you have most of the Fortune 500 now making enormous profits in China. So when Beijing needs something, they talk to their American corporate buddies and they say, why don't you go send your guys up on the hill? And it's not going to look like it's us doing it, but that way we get what we want and you'll get what you want. That is a continuing flow of profits. And that's how it's done. I'm not worried about a trade war with the Chinese because, frankly, we're already in a trade war and America is losing. What I want to ask people who are afraid of a trade war is how exactly does a country that's running a $500 billion a year trade deficit lose a trade war with the rest of the world? It's pretty much inevitable at this point that the dollar is going to slide. There's no question that the dollar is an internationally overvalued currency. Now, whether the dollar slides gradually over a number of years or whether it exhibits a sudden crash, I can't tell you. Anyone who can, they ought to come here in a private jet because that's not a million dollar question, it's a billion dollar question. If you can truly answer that question, you'd be, you'd be a billionaire. Now, what this means for the American people is when the dollar goes down, everything we own in dollars becomes an internationally denominated money. It becomes slightly less valuable. Now, the average American is not going to care about the fact that the internationally measured value of their house or their 401k is less than it was. But what is going to happen is it is going to create inflationary pressures in the US economy when, when the dollar slides. And anyone who's against us, it's pretty much inevitable at this point because the present system we have with an overvalued dollar, we get all these cheap foreign goods which make us, us feel richer than we are. That's coming to an end, I'm afraid.
Protectionism kind of has a bad name to some extent because it's been focused in the last couple of decades on trying to protect industries that are already dying, like the steel industry was in terrible trouble, textiles, and so forth. That is sometimes the right thing to do, but it's far more important to use protectionism as a tool to capture the industries of the future and to protect the industries of the present from falling into trouble, not simply as an ambulance to rescue industries that are already in trouble. There's a myth in this country that manufacturing is obsolescent and that we can all look forward to a bright future where we do abstract things, we provide services, and so on and so forth. The reality is that manufacturing is by no means a primitive or obsolescent sector of the economy. It's true that low-grade manufacturing of the final assembly of products where you're just sticking components together, that you can have that done by semi-illiterate labor, uh, which is cheap labor anywhere in the world, and that is true. But if you're talking about the manufacture of sophisticated goods like computer components or jet turbine engines or even automobiles, that is simply not a fact. Why is it, I have to ask people who believe in this post-industrial mythology, that high-wage countries like Germany and Japan, which pay manufacturing wages equal to or greater than the United States, are still leading centers of car manufacturing? It's simply not true that you can't do manufacturing in developed countries. That is pure mythology. Frankly, Barack Obama's agenda on trade has been indistinguishable from that of George W. Bush. During the 2008 Democratic primaries, around the time of the Ohio and Pennsylvania primaries, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama got into a bit of a contest as to who could denounce NAFTA, and they both did at that time. Immediately after Barack Obama had the nomination sewed up, he started to backpedal on his comments. and. Uh, he was actually caught sending one of his campaign advisors, Austin Goolsby, to talk to the Canadian consulate in Chicago and tell them, well, we've been attacking NAFTA on the campaign trail, but don't worry, we don't really mean it. The present order in the United States, with the United States practicing one-sided free trade, is, I think, doomed no matter what. It's inevitably going to go away. Personally, I would have no problem with going back to the Teddy Roosevelt era of a tariff-protected economy, but there's more than one way to skin a cat here.